This is episode 266 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. And now a word from our sponsor, Control and Compound. Infinite banking in under 60 seconds. We've all got to save our money somewhere, and we think that a high cash value life insurance policy is the perfect place to save it. Why? We're going to save our money inside this policy, and it's going to grow tax-free. Down the road, we're going to get hit with an emergency or an opportunity, maybe a chance to buy a business, real estate property an income producing asset. And instead of withdrawing from our savings account, we're going to leverage that asset. We're going to borrow the insurance company's money and we're going to invest in that opportunity. Our money is still inside of that policy, compounding, uninterrupted, tax-free, and our money's outside in this investment opportunity. We're going to rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, all while providing a death benefit for our families. Down the road, we're going to retire Now we retire with a high cash value life insurance policy with a lot of cash. We're going to start taking those policy loans again, but this time we're never going to pay them back. When I say never, I mean we're going to pay them back with the death benefit when we die and our families are going to get left with the rest completely tax-free. For more information, visit www.controllingcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have Austin Ye back on after nearly 200 episodes. So it's been quite some time, something like four years. And Austin's been very busy. He's quit his job. He's become a wholesaler. He's now getting his mortgage license. This is a guy that's an absolute doer, has accomplished big things in real estate investing and in the real estate industry. And uh, he shows no signs of quitting. So since he last came on the show, he's built a community. He has uh, many different people in that, that community and a lot of them turned out to be buyers of his wholesale deals when he started that. So uh, nothing short of impressive is uh, how I would describe Austin. And I was grateful to have him back on the show after so long. I had to twist his arm to get him to come back on. Uh, Just kidding. Obviously, Austin, I really appreciate you doing this. Just before we jump into the episode, as always, I'm going to remind you that a lot of the terminology we use on this show uh, might seem new if you've never been into real estate investing before. Uh, I highly recommend that you go right back to episode one through 10 if that's you and uh, just familiarize yourself with the terminology that we use. Um, That really was meant as an introductory uh, course, so to speak, when I started this podcast. I assumed absolutely no knowledge, whereas on modern episodes, I'm assuming a certain base level of knowledge when I'm talking to guests. So if you find that you're having a little bit of trouble, head on back there and then head right back up to current episodes and you should be up to speed. And uh, of course, if you have any questions or something that's not clicking for you, feel free to reach out to me on uh, say Instagram's probably the best place at the Andrew Hines is my profile. So without further ado, let's jump into the episode number 266 with Austin Ye. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I've got the great Austin Ye on the show. It's been many years, like episode 62, I think it was. Uh, and we're Damn, on, you have some good memory. <laughs> dude, we're on like 260 something now. Like we're talking four years uh, since you've yeah. been on. Um, I specifically remember your episode because I have to apologize for this. I I, uh, I had quite the intro to your episode just going into the state of COVID lockdowns and uh, my opinion of the matter uh so sorry your episode got tarnished with that but uh but (laughs) if you go back you'll see i'm pretty much batting a thousand on my predictions um and we continue where we left off (laughs) anyways austin thanks for doing this yeah no i appreciate you having me back on man very exciting we have a lot a lot to catch up on dude yeah well start from the top just give people your backstory um, just where you started and where you're at now. Yeah. Um, so essentially just, just a quick recap. I started investing in late 2018, uh, bought a single family in Windsor at the time where we were having our podcast together. I was in the middle of raising capital and, and joint venturing with other individuals, uh, continue that trend since I did a couple of more JV since our podcast have, uh, has come out. Um, but the structure of the JV really changed a lot, um, over the past year or two, uh, just because of how I wouldn't say how difficult, but 
I guess it's more difficult to raise capital than than it was back in 2021, 2022, early 2022. So I've been doing JV still. The structure has changed um, and also have been buying some multifamily properties myself. Slowed down on that just because, um, you know, the risk of, of tenant turnaround and, and being stuck with, a, with an asset that I wouldn't necessarily want to hold if it's fully inherited tenants. Um, right. So I've been doing that. I started wholesaling as well. And uh, I'm about to get into the mortgage business soon enough too. Uh, maybe maybe it will be live when when this episode comes out. But that's a little bit about what yeah. I've been working on. Just a, just a few <laughs> things. Just a few things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Windsor was one spot. And then you uh, you also up, uh, invested up north, correct? That's right. Yeah, I started investing up in Sudbury. I found that the numbers in Windsor, I guess this is with a lot of cities, they start getting tighter and tighter as more investors jump in. Uh, mm -hmm. And the rent rolls necessarily weren't keeping up with, with the asset price appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't make sense. When I started refinancing these assets, I was pretty much close to neutral cash flow, um, which is not where I want to be at all. No. Well, that's kind of the uh, curse of a lot of properties in Ontario in general is just neutral cash flow. You're kind of winning on a lot of them, um, but not on others. I, of course, I think that'll change over time as rents continue to climb, if they will. I mean, who knows? Anything could mm -hmm. happen. But um, I think a big, a big thing in some of these cities is that although rents are climbing, I, w I wouldn't say they're climbing at a rapid pace as we're seeing in the GTA. I feel like the tenant quality doesn't necessarily improve, right? So you're you're dealing with, no. and I'm, I'm having situations where I'm dealing with people who are paying me quote unquote market rent, which is obviously quite elevated in those Northern markets, uh, but they're working the same job that they did two, three years ago, making a similar sort of- And they can't, yeah, they can't afford it. So you know their only option right. is to, to let their brother-in-law live with them. And like, they're gonna have rent helpers. That's, and exactly. I've seen this for a long time and I was calling it out saying, this is the future. This is what you're going to get. And uh, now we're just going to mm -hmm. see that on steroids. Of course, like they'll make it more official with, you know, the multi-units, but it's either we go to multi-units in one house or people are all just going to live in one house anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and what I'm even finding on top of that is like, obviously vacancies are quite low in pretty much almost every city in Ontario, even mm -hmm. some of the tertiary markets. But despite that, a vast majority of the applications are absolute garbage. So I'm dealing with a few yeah. non-payment of rents right now and over the past mm -hmm. couple of months, and it's been an absolute pain in my ass. Yeah. Like you eventually are just going to have to become an expert in it, right? Like I was talking to uh, James Fernandez and he is basically an expert at dealing with LTB right. because he inherited 70 some odd tenants and just mm -hmm. like 15 of them were like not paying. When I talked mm -hmm. to him, 15 were actively not paying. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, guess, so I, was gonna add, really I guess when you're buying, yeah, I guess when you're buying the property and you have non-payment, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You have a clear path for tenant turnaround. It's just when you start putting these tenants in mm -hmm. an already sort of renovated property where it becomes a little bit frustrating. I've been I've been getting really good at uh, actually tenant negotiations. So I've been handling, although I have property management, I've been handling a lot of those conversations myself. And mm -hmm. fortunately, the vast majority of them don't get to the LTB hearing. We're able to figure something out prior to it getting, getting yeah and I, I never understood it because if you have like somewhat reasonable people um like i i've always just found i could weasel my way out even with the, the people who hated my guts i just call them up and reason with them i had a yeah. tenant him and his wife they had been with me for like four or five years and she hated me like uh, that's the politest way i could put it even though I, I it was not me like i mean i could see it, it's just like the sentiment about landlords like you're a big bad landlord uh yeah. but you know they they didn't fulfill any of their end of the bargain constantly late whatever and then they were just gonna up and leave the property and you know stiff me for months of rent and all that i'm like hey look like this is how this is gonna go i don't want that you don't want that let's just right. agree to part ways here's what i'll do for you and we, we talked it out and although she stayed at the car and wouldn't come anywhere near, the husband had to come back and forth <laughs> to get the thing signed. We yeah. got it done. You know what I mean? Like there is, there is a way to reason with even the, the most hostile of people if you can just find a way. So I'm curious, what are you, what are some of your tactics? Like how do you break the ice and disarm people a little bit? I think I think the big thing is is that when I was growing my portfolio, I focused a lot on a property manager or paralegals, which in my opinion, they do great work for what they do, but it's transactional basis. They're not really there building any sort of report with the tenants whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've started taking things into my own hands where if there's like a non-payment of, of rent, that's, to me, that's a, a job that's gonna be like thousands of dollars per hour, because if it drags on, then you're gonna be shit out of luck 
uh, a lot of money out of your pocket. And then, and if they end up destroying the place, which in a lot of cases, they, you know, if they're, if they're not too happy, they're getting evicted, they may damage the property. It's going to cost you like tens of thousands of dollars. So usually when that happens, I immediately give them, I file the paperwork, like the, uh, the N4 or whatever paperwork it is that that's causing them, um, to need to eventually be evicted. And I give them a call and I let them know, I was like, Hey, just to give you a heads up, I filed this paperwork. You're going to get it. Don't be alarmed, right? Just sort of do process for me to protect myself and my investors. Um, but I noticed that, for example, you you haven't paid rent. Um, what is like, is there is there something going on? Like, have you lost your job? Is there something that I can help you with? I just want to better understand your situation because I don't want to evict you. Um, there's probably a solution that we can figure mm-hmm. out. And then I just sort of start off being empathetic, whereas I feel like most people go in mm-hmm. guns blazing, like I need to get this person out, try to go cash for keys immediately. I, I don't I don't try to do cash for keys immediately. Like I leave that further on to the discussion if that's the, really the only sort of alternative. Uh, but just understanding their point of view and what happened because p- good, you know, bad things happen to good people. Um, just because a tenant doesn't pay your rent doesn't necessarily mean that they're avoiding it. So once I fully understand the situation, it's like, if they're not going to be able to pay me back rent, then first and foremost, I see if they can have their parents co-sign, right? Or someone who has good credit, who has good income, who can co-sign on their behalf, right? I was like, hey, look, soon enough, you're going to have to find another place. I'm willing to let you stay for a little bit longer as you figure things out. But in order to do that, I'm going to need some sort of co-signer, right? So I'm trying to find ways to protect my downside risk. Mm-hmm. Or alternatively, I'll be like, if they're like, oh, I'll be able to pay next month or in two months guaranteed, then I might tell them, okay, so what we can do is sign this on 11 and date it one month out, right? Like if you're able to meet the payment plan or if if, if you're able to keep to your word, then I'll just throw this away. Nothing to worry about, right? But if not then I will have to push this towards the LTB or we're going to have to have a further conversation. And and part of the reason I do that is because N11s take like two to three months to get through the LTB and then you get the eviction notice. I, for me, it's even a couple of weeks sometimes it's happened where I file it and then in four or five weeks it, mm-hmm. I, I, I get like notice. But mm-hmm. um, it's better than going through the entire L1 process. Yeah, N11 is the agreement both or the tenants uh, notice to leave. Correct. Yeah, agreement right. and yeah, mutual agreement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm surprised they would even sign that because, like, technically, you don't have to honor your word once they've signed that, right? They're they're agreeing to leave. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I think part of it is is that, like, again, it depends on how you approach it. Like, I start off very soft, understanding mm-hmm. their point of view and really trying to make an effort to figure out a solution. And like, that's the worst case. That's if they start giving me like, yeah. oh, like I'll pay it in a month. It's like, okay, let me let me ensure that you actually will pay mm-hmm. it in a month, right? So it keeps them honest as well. Yeah. Oh, that's great, man. Like the key thing you're you're showing here is that just talking to people can can make all the difference. Right. Um, yeah. There's some things you don't want to outsource. And I think that's actually one of them. I agree. Like person. dealing with your tenants and they're your customers. It's, uh, you know, outsourcing that. Like, of course, outsource your processes. But, you know, cr- critical conversations, they, they pay thousands of dollars per hour and saving headaches. So that's right. Exactly. Um, that, that right there is a good reason to do those calls, even though it's tough, but that's the business, right? And unless you get somebody in your organization that you can hire, that's just as good at it as you are, and then they can do Mm -hmm. it. Uh, but as you pointed out, if you hire outside property management, it's a transaction. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard, I had, um, one guy, I'm not going to name a name right now, but he was mentioning that, uh, he, he would just hire a paralegal every time he wanted somebody out cash for keys, they would negotiate it. He'd be 10 grand every time. I'm like, your paralegal is the reason it's 10 grand every time. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> that's like, they're just saying, Oh, well, this is standard. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, and I get it. Cause if you're doing enough of them, you don't want to have that conversation over and over again, but it does pay to do it. It does pay to do it. Exactly. You'll save a lot of money. Uh, if you don't go through, I don't want to like, there's some paralegals who are great at it, but for the most part, again, it's a, it's a transaction. So how much mm-hmm. of a discount are you going to get from that? It's and, like and a even property now, manager, they're never not. as, they're never as invested in your property as you are. Like they're never going to treat it like it's theirs. That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to be mm-hmm. real about that. It's not, there's nothing negative about that. That's just obvious. That's, that would be naive not to think that mm-hmm. um, anyways. Um, tell me a little bit about the, the changes. Cause I, I mean, since you were on, I know that you were on, was it blog to or Toronto life? Yeah. The Toronto life article. <laughs> Toronto life. Yeah. That blew up, uh, like awareness of you. 
Mm-hmm. Tell me about mm-hmm. that because that was a long time ago now. But did that sort of change your trajectory? Because all of a sudden, you know, your episode of the podcast is getting a ton of views. People were seeing my political opinions, which I thought was funny. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, after the uh, podcast blew up, a lot of hate. Uh, I feel like if it was to come out today, there'd be even more hate. I think uh, it's funny. I was on a podcast, Cody A's Wealthbusters podcast, and I was talking about not letting people know that I'm a real estate investor. I know everyone wants to put it out there, but when I introduce myself to most people, I'm sort of ashamed to mention it because there's so much negative connotation around it. But it did help with branding. There's a lot of hate, a lot of death threats. But at the end of the day, after a while, all of the haters sort of moved on to, you know, focus on something else. And then there, there was followers along with the journey. So it really helped blow up the Rise podcast, the Rise community. And mm-hmm. obviously that helped me continue to build my branding and, and credibility. And at the, just around the same time, I was starting up a wholesaling business. So like that was directly potential buyers to jump on my wholesaling list. And at that time, most of my wholesale yeah. deals were in Northern Ontario. So it yeah. was like sort of a perfect mesh. Yeah. I mean, of course, like they say, yeah, any publicity is good publicity. And there's obviously some truth to that. Although, I mean, there's some stuff that you obviously don't want, but, um, yeah, that's, (laughs) that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting, uh, thing that happened to you. So how, how, like how many people would you say you kind of came into your sphere because of that? Are we talking like thousands, tens of thousands? Yeah, it was like, probably I gained 2000 followers over, over that article. Yeah, so it's quite a, it's quite a bit of people. That's huge. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you pushed for that, right? Like you you reached out to them to feature you. Yeah, so a big part of what I was doing at that time was just reaching out to every single media outlet. So shooting people one paragraph about my story. So I did it to Toronto Life, um, Blog To, Toronto Star, just every single media article to see which one would pick me up. I didn't. I don't think I really had a rhyme or reason other than continuing to build branding and credibility. I yeah. figured that once I get into a role that is sort of commission-based or tied, like where I can leverage the credibility yeah, yeah. to either sell a product or service, then I would get the value from it, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and it's easier to sort of sell yourself and build credibility if you don't have a product or service to sell. So I was yeah. just like, let's sort of put all the pieces in place. Dude, that's exactly the way I was with the podcast. Like I had nothing to sell uh, for, in mm-hmm. fact, uh, I mean, if you look at the net, I mean, yeah, I made money from coaching, but like it's net cost me money, <laughs> but right, I did right. some of the coaching because of the awareness. So that helped. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like mm-hmm. it's, it, that's important. A uh, great point to bring up, like start getting out there, get your name out there before you're asking for anything, you know, build the trust first. Cause if you come out asking before there's trust, then it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. I think uh, a big way to go about like what I've been focusing on now is I've been shifting a lot of my effort to LinkedIn actually. So it seems like everyone has jumped on to the Instagram bandwagon and um a lot of social media it's really a highlight reel i'm sure you you know i know there's there's a lot of people that show their highlight reel on there but behind the scenes there's other things going on um and so i find that it's hard to differentiate between credible and uncredible people and on 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 uh instagram and again there's just a flood of content there and the unta- and likewise with TikTok as well. Like that being said, both platforms still work if you work it hard enough. But yeah. I feel like there's not many investors on LinkedIn, and that's a huge untapped potential for them to educate the audience on there. And a lot of yeah. the leads on LinkedIn are qualified, right? You're not yeah. reaching out to professionals. People. Yeah, like the pe- the type of people who are on uh, LinkedIn are generally well to do. And, you know, they're going to have investment dollars to put to work. So you're still actively looking for, for JV partners, would you say? No, not necessarily. So I slowed down. I joined venture partners and started doing a couple of projects myself. Um, It was a personal decision to stop doing JVs. At that time when I was doing it, it was because I was quite limited on capital. I was good at finding deals, hence me also eventually branding off into wholesaling too. Um, But I didn't necessarily have the liquidity to take advantage of all of the the deals myself. So I started um, raising capital uh, from a debt point of view to finance my own deals. And that's sort of the approach. Approach I took. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn primarily because I am going to be entering a sales commission based role uh, in, in this space. And I feel like, again, everyone is on, um, everyone's on Instagram, everyone's on TikTok. So it's just, again, a, a big differentiator for me mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, I don't know if we want to get into this, but 
shifting from raising equity partners to debt partners was uh another stress on its own because uh when i was uh when i was doing when i was raising debt big part of it is is that you're sort of on a time constraint right um to get the oh, yeah. project done yeah and there's like cash outflow every single month the interest mm -hmm. rates are quite expensive and i was doing it on multifamily properties too which is even more stressful because it is contingent on the turnaround of units um yep. so i bought an eight plex and i was paying 12 percent interest uh a year fully tenanted um i was just we got it at a good price it was below market value but at the end of the day who really cares about what below market value is if you can't turn around tenants yeah. ultimately so we got it in rural sudbury for 395k uh again got private money on it and then just worked hard in tenant turnaround i'm I'm pretty efficient in, in cash for keys. I'm pretty good at having those conversations. It's a skill set I'm comfortable in. But that being said, even though we're able to turn around seven out of the eight units, it was one of the most stressful periods of my investing journey. And I, at that time, concurrently, I was doing it with another six plus, fully levered up, promissory notes, first, second in charge mortgages, and then fully tenanted and having yeah. to turn around all of the units. Um, it seems like that's what's been getting a lot of people in trouble nowadays is, is levering up on, on these multis and trying to find exits. But fortunately, I was able to exit each each one of them, refinance all of my money out and, and sort of just carry the asset from there. But I don't know if it's something that I'd continue doing. To be, yeah, to it's be uncomfortable, honest. man. Like that is not to be taken lightly. And mm -hmm. there was a time for all of us where you go high leverage, but... I mean, you know, if, if it goes wrong, you basically put yourself in hell, right? And uh, that's right. You know, we've seen some people in our networks that are going through that. So, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, like I said, not to be taken lightly. I like, I love the idea of, of going equity, you know, getting somebody who believes in the project, wants to work it. And, uh, you know, then you don't have that gun to your head. You still go, right. obviously, because you want to grow. But I mean, the, the things that that can enable is actually great. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so so the debt, the debt is a challenge. So did you find yourself getting caught on any of the deals you were working on? Like in, in that, because obviously we've seen a correction, depending on the market, you yeah. know, 25%. Um, what what are the markets that you've been working in look like in terms of a correction in price? And uh, how has that affected you? Yeah. So in terms of existing rental portfolio, didn't really impact me too much, largely because when I left my job in 2021, I a lot of these properties that I had were in my personal name. So I wasn't able to refi them anymore anyway. So I the last time I refied them was February 2021. So I didn't go mm -hmm. out of the way and over leveraging my existing portfolio. I did, however, get caught on a fix and flip pretty recently. I lost about eighty or ninety thousand dollars on it in a fix and flip in Toronto. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit. So the market, the market was recovering early 2023. By recovering, I use that word loosely. It was getting hotter, quote unquote, in, in early 2023, mm -hmm. because bond yields were, uh, bond yields dropped due to the, the banking crisis in the States, the regional banking crisis. And so things were heating up in, in, in the GTA again, they were having multiple offers. So I got a deal in, in little Portugal. So that's Dufferin and Dundas, semi-detached house, $830,000 is what I picked it up for uh, in, a, in a pretty prime location. And in order to try my best to make the numbers work, I negotiated a vendor take back uh, at 3.2% interest rate. Nice. And it was a seven, it was a seven month term. Yeah, so, so pretty discounted. And I was feeling confident going into the deal. Then, of course, the market being volatile over the past two years, the market sort of shifted. And then we entered into the lowest 20 year sales volume in Toronto. So by the time I wrapped up the project and I think it was like August, August 2023, we're in the midst of one of the slowest, the slowest times the past 20 years in Toronto in terms of sales volume. So my property just ended up sitting there and my VTB was only seven months long, right? And this is a property that there's there's not multiple exit strategies. You, I don't want to rent out a, a million dollar product, oh, right? No. Single family yeah. home. So I was just sort of waiting there, getting, getting people walking through, getting good feedback, a lot of good feedback, but just no one was pulling the trigger. The, I feel like just liquidity and buyers just tightened up. I ended up actually selling the property at a pretty huge discount. So I full I I bought it for eight thirty. I put in about a hundred and ten thousand into it. 
Then there's double land transfer tax. There's four, I think it was 4% realtor fees. The transaction costs in Toronto are quite expensive, but I ended up selling it at 950. 950,000. Um, so I, I took a wash of about 80,000. And that was the deal when I was underwriting it. Uh, there was not a single comparable that was renovated that sold sub a million dollars in that location. That's pretty much close to downtown. I, I would right. consider it, well, not downtown, but very close to downtown. And it's a freehold house. Um, and even then I got I got caught holding the bag. So uh, learning lessons, learning lessons there for sure. Yeah. And in yeah. terms of Oh, sorry, go for it. I was just going to say, that's where your exit strategies are, right? Like having mm -hmm. those multiple exits, man. Otherwise, I just... And that's, for me, why I've, not, I've shied away from that kind of market. If I didn't have a good, hey, I could just rent this out. Um, unless I felt like my, my plan A was strong enough. Like if you... Yeah, yeah, and I know you said you felt like it was really strong. Um, it's tough. I guess you'll you'll recalibrate for what's really strong in the, uh, in the future to, <laughs> to do that kind of project. Dude, yeah, it blew my mind. I never would I have thought it would sell sub a million, but you never know, right? And that and that's the importance of it is not over leveraging as well, because I paid so it was ninety two percent VTV, which I got on I quote unquote it was a discounted price. All of the renovations funded in cash, the rest of the down payment in cash. So I try not to take prom notes on on doing that deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did you end up having to put money in to close it? to pay out that vtb uh no i didn't fortunately again Damn. just because like all the i didn't get all my money back out though like no, I had no, a lot no. of rent yeah. cost that was still gone there's another fix and flip i did during the market downturn and this was a wholesale deal where we had we legitimately had buyers interested in it but i was like oh it's not the price that i want so i'm just gonna fix and flip it myself there's a ton of mm -hmm. margin on it and again the market shifted uh, yeah. This was in Sudbury. So I was able to refi the majority, like 90% of my money out from this single family home mm -hmm. um, and rent it out and be relatively cash flow neutral. But uh, yeah, I mean, going forward, I'm only going to do fix and flips that's, uh, that have multiple, multiple exit strategies. Cause I almost got, yeah. if that was a high price point, I would have got caught in that one too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my co-author John on the book, we're going to be dropping, like he had three properties like that, like multi hundred thousand dollar losses on them. So you, you, uh, you did better than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to, it's yeah. not, this is probably not the most, the best finance advice, but when it comes to fixing and flipping my motto in this current market is, is that I buy the house in cash or with minimal leverage. Yeah. So last year I did another couple of fix and flips, 100% cash, 100% renovation budget uh, was in mm -hmm. cash. And so all of the debt costs were out and I was making about like $30,000, $40,000 of flip within three months time frame, right? And and no risk, not no risk, but very little risk. Do you, I mean, obviously you have a wholesaling company. So why bother doing fix and flips if you can just, basically take your money up front like if right. what why not wholesale i guess is the real question because a lot of times and maybe the investor appetite for a, a fixer upper isn't there but my mentality has shifted more towards like the the even greater degree of protection for me is is capitalize on existing sentiment like if the market's good now it doesn't mean it'll be good in eight months so right. i'd like to capitalize on today if i get a great deal what do you think about all that do you do you try to capitalize sooner, you know, tighten up that, uh, that timeline. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I've sort of shifted towards wholesaling every deal, no matter if I feel like if I get an offer and there's still a lot of meat on the bone and I want to flip it, I just opt towards selling it and, and just taking the profits out. I think the big thing is, is that investors want a lot of meat on the bone and I don't blame them because that's likewise with me, but sometimes as a result, the assignment fee may be let's say 10, 15 K, whereas the potential profits on flipping it could be like 70 or 80,000. Mm -hmm. And on top of the price that I'm getting it at, maybe the profits would be a little bit more, right? So it was a hard sort of trade off yeah. between the two, but, I, but I'm leaning towards being in and out quickly. But the profit is always has to be compared to how much you're risking. Like how right. many, what's the purchase price? Like, are you making 70,000 on a $400,000 purchase? That start, that sounds great. But if you're making yeah. it on a million, that does not sound good in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. That's why we've shifted towards uh, completely wholesaling right now. And the market is, 
is picking up for better mm. or for worse in January and February. In our wholesaling business, like when things were really slow on MailChimp, which is what we use for like our email facilitation, our email management, our open rate was about like 30 to 35% on emails that we're sending out. And now it's back up to the 50% range, which is quite normal. That was what we were seeing back in 2020. For a wholesaling list. Yeah, that's not Correct. normal for an email list in general, but that's that's uh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So we're definitely seeing sentiment pick back up. And so we're going to double down on while the, uh, to your point, while the market is hot, while the market's doing well, double down on your marketing costs, try to wholesale as many deals as possible. And then if it does slow down in the summer, which who knows it might, if the bank of Canada chooses to delay rate cuts, then in that mm -hmm. situation, um, at least I know that I've made the bulk of our money while the market was doing well, right. Instead mm -hmm. of spreading it out, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Austin, tell me about the the wholesaling business. Why go get your mortgage license if you're you're already a wholesaler? <laughs> Why do you need to be doing a million things? Right, right. Uh, so the wholesaling business, uh, it's very, it's 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 similar to almost like a realtor business, if that makes sense. It's sentiment based. So when you see things start drying up um, on on the market and there's not multiple offers people have less incentive to buy wholesale deals just because a lot of times when you buy wholesale deals, you have to go clean, right? No conditions. Mm -hmm. But if you can start negotiating very great structured deals on the MLS, which is what was possible mid 2022, late 2022 and late 2023, mm -hmm. like the need for wholesaling, there's still value there if you're buying discounted, obviously, but it, it becomes harder to justify. So we definitely saw our business move through the same cycles as a realtor, but be even impacted more because it's an investors who drop out first before home buyers. Right. Um, so we've seen like sort of the ups and downs. Um, and also just the mortgage business does sort of complement the, the wholesaling business. I've had oh, deals sure. where... But there was one deal recently where it was like a fire burnt property. We wholesaled it to a buyer. They weren't able to get funding for it. The mortgage agent wasn't able to help them. Uh, again, at this time, I'm, uh, I'm I'm not licensed. I should make that clear, but soon to be. But I got involved and found him a private money lender. Well, I didn't broker the deal. I was like, here's a contact, like speak with them. Maybe they'll be able to get this finance. So I feel like I'm more in control yeah. of the process. Things fall apart on the financing end a lot of times with mm -hmm. wholesale deals. Yeah. So I just want to be more oh, for sure. Yeah. You can just control it. You got in house. Like, yeah, I think there's definitely, but I mean, even just partnering with a mortgage broker too, was a potential, but Hey, you chose this path and I'm sure you'll do well with it. <laughs> uh, I think right. your, your podcast, your co-host on your podcast, uh, also is in the mortgage biz, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. Shout yeah. out to Mayu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was recently on the podcast as well. So you guys are an interesting uh, duo because you're you're both crushing it, doing different things, right? You're not actually mm -hmm. doing deals together, or maybe you've done a couple. Yeah, we did a we we did a lot of uh, early. My was actually my first JV partner, our second one. We did a lot of early properties together. Nice. Mm -hmm. But and sorry, I just to round back up to your to your wholesaling question, like how yeah. how it's going there. Yeah. So I mean, sentiment has picked up. We're getting multiple offers again. Um, weird situation in terms of where do I see the wholesaling business like the next coming months? I don't know exactly. I think it's all like everyone's trying yeah. to front run the Bank of Canada, including real estate investors as well. Mm -hmm. If the Bank of Canada doesn't cut rates in, let's say May or. I, I guess there's, there was like over 90% chance of a rate cut in May. If they yeah. don't cut in May and the sentiment changes, the verbiage changes, then I could easily see the market just shifting back. Oh, yeah. To where it it's before. totally sentiment driven, which is, yeah. is wild to be at the mercy of crazy people in the Bank of Canada and the government. But um, it's uh, it's interesting because they've obviously... Um, said that they're going to hold you know there's rumors that they're going to people were pricing in that they were going to cut and then they're yeah. saying wow we might have to hold a raise and i see the argument for that and then i've i've also i was just talking to matt biche today and he was talking about how he thinks they're going to cut like definitely this year like you know cut in, in april and gave his rationale for why and uh, it's interesting like no one knows for sure but right. uh you know there are people who are pr predicting deflation uh, i mean one thing to point out is that uh, GDP per capita is is like stagnant for right. many many years. It, it's actually and, started declining the past like, yeah yeah like a couple quarters yeah. Which means on a per capita basis, uh, people are creating less value. They're right. creating less wealth. Um, and in the America, that's not the case. There's it's still growing. 
And right. uh, if it wasn't for immigration, we would we would be in monstrous recession, like yeah. devastating recession. So it's kind of an illusion because I mean, how much more can they drive people into this country? Right. So then like, say mm -hmm. we do go into that, you know, heavy, heavy uh, GDP decline, they would, you would think they would have to cut, cut rates and accept mm -hmm. stagflation. Like they would have to mm -hmm. just to stimulate mm -hmm. things. And I don't know, you know, this is me talking. Well, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know who knows, because I mean, yeah. the immigrate, uh, like the population growth has been a problem for a few years now, and it feels like just now they're starting to acknowledge it before sort of just yeah. brushing off. Soldiers. Well, as long as they could brush it off, they could keep doing what they were doing. Like the million right. people over, like it was, it was like maybe two quarters ago, uh, the, the previous four quarters were a million people. Um, yeah. That was like kind of a nail in the coffin. Like the cat right. was out of the bag. Like you couldn't ignore it anymore. It's like, why can't I find a place to live? <laughs> why are rents and, doubling? And <laughs> shelter inflation is the most stickiest part. Right. Yeah. And that's driven by inflation. Yeah. It's just right. wild. Right. Right. Yeah. And how do they fix it? Right. So, so if that lever is gone, you know, what levers do they have? And I think accepting uh, an abnormally high level of inflation is probably going to be what happens at some point. Right. So, mm -hmm. and, and I never, you never know for sure. Right. We're just speculating. But uh, yeah. So I, I was I, listening. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Finish your thoughts. No, no, I'm good. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast. Do you know the Looney Hour, Andrew? I heard of this. You're the second person that's recommended it. Yeah, it's it's like a macroeconomic podcast, but they narrow down in Canada mm -hmm. and sometimes also address like the real estate market. They've had a guest on. I don't remember who. It's a bright bunch of people. Um, and uh, one of the, the the guests were saying the, the big difference in productivity in Canada and the U.S. Is, is that you think about like you look at U.S. when people think about like passive income, like the everyday person to look at investing in like the S&P 500 in in, in, in productive stocks, right, that are going to that are actually going to create value in the economy. Whereas you look at a Canadian, everyone like instantly jumps into real estate, which is not productive to an economy. Right. Mm. Um, so, it, I mean, it's a big shift in mentality as well when you go in the U.S. and like, who, which Canadian do you know is realistically investing in, in the Toronto Stock Exchange or any? Probably not. Well, many. it's not in my circles. <laughs> like, I couldn't just... even. I'm so outside of it. I mean, I know they exist. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, like, and I'm sure you get this too. Like, everyone you talk to is like a real estate investor. Like, or, That's right. yeah, or they <laughs> listen to you talk to uh, talk about it so much that they basically are by default. Um, so it's tough, yeah. Because like in my bubble, everybody's in real estate. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh that makes it tough. Um what's your wholesaling company's uh name? Ontario Property Deals. Ontario Property Deals. I actually didn't know that was yours. I was on your mailing list. I'm like, who is this? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. Now I know. Yeah, actually, mm -hmm. uh, it was from your interview for the book that I found that out actually. Um nice. but yeah, good good for you guys for doing that. Tell me about like what your marketing efforts are, like what that looks like, why that made sense to you as an entrepreneur to go out and do that. Yeah, originally when I was, um, so by the way, my wholesaling partner is Waylon McGill. We we're both doing sort of wholesaling on our own. I sort of just got into it because I was raising money with joint venture partners. Sometimes there were deals that fell on my plate that didn't necessarily make sense for me. So I just find an investor to assign it to. I didn't think much of it, but as I was reflecting on wanting to leave my full-time job, I would need another active stream of income. So it sort of complemented what I was doing already. Will and McGill was entering into the wholesaling space as well. He's in tech sales, right? So I'm not I'm not a great salesman, so everything I learned in terms of sales was definitely with the help of Waylon. So we decided to partner together. I had sort of the real estate niche and expertise. Waylon had this corporate sales background, and then we started Ontario Property Deals. Um, it made sense. I mean, the market was doing well, and the return on it, like mainly at the beginning, what we we're doing as mailers for the most part, uh, got saturated because there were a lot of people starting to do mailers. So we started expanding into like digital marketing as well, Facebook ads, like Facebook ads, um, yeah. Right, right. Facebook ads, uh, like Google ads. Um, we started, we, we did a bunch of creative stuff. We put our name on, we rented a bus for a year, not rented, but we rented the advertising space for a bus and just like wrapped the entire bus with Fast Ontario Home Buyer, which is our 
buying side at the acquisition side of the company um that didn't get any leads so that was unfortunate we spent about 10 grand on that but just try i don't want to dive too deep into into what the acquisition strategies are but one thing i will leave your audience with that what we're doing now that's working pretty successfully is is that we're going back to the basics of cold calling when you think of these big corporate companies mm -hmm. like salesforce or like whatever huge tech companies yeah. cold calling is a big part of what bdrs do right business development reps so we've yeah. been doing a lot of cold calling with our um, bird dogs or where they're almost like our, our bdrs so they're picking up the phone and calling realtors they're calling pest control companies they're calling like um contractors and just getting the name out there that we're looking for off-market deals and we were able to do like first of all it costs no money for this marketing strategy whatsoever and just from that alone with one of our bird dogs, we were able to do over six figures in revenue just, just last year, just by doing that, no marketing costs. Yeah. And that's from a single bird dog. What kind of criteria were you were you uh, having them uh, use? Like, hey, if you see a house that has broken windows or boarded up, I mean, you're gonna find a lot of development sites that have that. Right. We weren't too picky, to be honest with you. Um, we know that most people were just not going to be interested. So we let them know, like, hey, if there's anything that's off the market where you know that a seller may potentially be looking to sell, and in a realtor's case, it would be apocalyptic, let us know we may be interested or we may have buyers that are interested. We didn't go mm -hmm. into too deep diving, explaining everything. So you didn't say, hey, we're going to be significantly under market value, but it'll be fast. You don't get into that? I mean, with the realtors, they obviously you know. should be aware of what's going on so i don't think there's any purpose to explain that with the um with like the other contractors like lawn care people etc cetera, etc cetera, we do let them know that we fix and flip right or our buyers yeah. will fix and flip and so they need the need meet on the bone we don't we tell them like every, with every seller that i interact with i let them know that we're making a profit they would need to know right like they're not stupid um they probably are yeah they, they probably profit, respect you more for being straight much. Yeah, they respect exactly. you respect you more. Hey, as you know, I need to make a profit here. We can't yeah, we can't pay our employees and keep the lights on if we don't. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel it's best if you just say that out loud, right? Like nobody would expect that you do something for free. But sometimes like if if you don't voice that, they do. Wait, wait, exactly. you're making money? Well, why would I be here? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah. I think being honest is is obviously one of the most important things as a wholesaler. Now there's obviously like the extent of honesty, you don't have to go there. Like, I'm trying to make a six figure fee on this. You don't have no, to disclose no, no, no. that. But right? I make but money like, on this. He, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you could even just put, hey, as you know, I got to make money here too. So, the, you know, in order for me to do this deal, for it to make sense for me, my investors, this is the number we got to do. And I, I don't exactly. know, you ever say it like that or paraphrased? Yeah. So usually how we go about it is, is that like, if we're invest, if we're, if we're, getting calls from north bay for example like we're not gonna go down we don't have an acquisition drop down there and we're probably not gonna go down there to meet a seller and spend our entire day for a maybe deal so we facilitate everything over the phone our first phone call is just information gathering and building rapport no almost no discussion on price right so the first phone call is is like what's the property what renovations did you do what renovations still need to be done we figure out their motivation we don't bluntly i feel like a lot of people will bluntly ask why are you selling i feel like that's a little bit of a personal question for people especially if you don't know who they are so we try to ask it in a different way we if they're living in the property we say what are your plans i mean you're selling this property now do you have somewhere else that you're looking at moving into and then that's another way of asking sort of like, what's your motivation, right? Like, yeah. what's your Richard game plan? Sometimes they they will let us know mm -hmm. like, oh, we're going to be looking for a house later on. It's like, okay, they're probably not immediately looking at selling. So anyways, first phone call is building rapport and getting information. Second phone call is about the numbers and analysis. So how we usually how we usually work it out is, is that our acquisition rep are the good guys and the analysis people the finance team the big boss which is me the decision maker is going to be the bad guy right mm -hmm. however the seller is going to be the one that always speaks with the acquisition rep who, who's a good person right he's trying to get, make so the good deal cop work. bad cop here basically good cop bad yeah. cop and it's called it's also called higher authority which mm -hmm. basically means that you can't negotiate the price with the person you're speaking to because they're yeah. not the decision maker right yeah. So you yeah, want exactly. that sort of gap in between. So yeah. I will go through, run the numbers, and then go over with the acquisition drop, and then give a call and walk through all the comps or analysis, and then let them have the floor in voicing their opinions. And, and a big part of what we find is when we take that approach, even if a seller is unhappy with the price, they understand they're speaking to the messenger. 
right? Yeah. Not the actual decision maker. And yeah. so what we do there is the messenger then asks them, if you disagree with this price, can you let me know why? And start as like, I can go back to my yeah. boss and bring like your disagreement point. So it almost sort of, you know, creates, creates yeah. more rapport. And then by the third phone call, we try to wrap up the deal, but that's how we sort of structure it with these, with these further off markets. Okay. So you don't make those phone calls, your acquisition rep does, and then you just get involved on the back end to, to say right. what you'll pay. And so who's inspecting your acquisition rep? They go and check the property out. Yeah. So usually we'll get either, sometimes we'll get a home inspector. Sometimes we'll get a property manager to take photos and videos and we'll just pay a random property manager $50 an hour. Property managers realistically should have a decent idea of what to look out for. So we give them sort of an instruction guide. Um, that's how we found we were able to best scale our business into different markets without having too much trouble figuring out team members. There's usually property managers in every market that, that you look at. Yeah, so you just call um, one off of Google and say, hey, would you be able to look at something for me? I'll pay a 50 an hour. Or if you have that's somebody, right. you can go. That's yeah. right. Or we might be interested in buying it ourselves and you can eventually manage it. And then we, yeah. can, we can get it that way. Or realtors. We have realtor partners as well. Yeah, that's that's a an interesting one. Um, it would make sense. So... As far as that goes, like, I mean, there was probably a time where you were negotiating it yourself. Like, do you, do you put to them, Hey, we've got to, this is our profit. So here's the comps. Here's the discount. We need to get it at over those comps. Yeah. So how we usually go about it is, is that obviously we're going to cherry pick a couple of the comps that make the most sense for us. We present it, uh, we present all of the data over to them and then we let them know that, Hey, this person sold it at $400,000, for example, but take a look at the condition. It's an immaculate condition. They've done all the repairs. They removed all the junk from this property. Second, they incurred staging costs. They maybe spent three, four thousand dollars in staging costs. Thirdly, they sold it at four hundred thousand dollars, but they paid five percent in realtor fees plus HST. So even if they sold it at four hundred, they're maybe walking away with three seventy, mm -hmm. right? For a turnkey property, your property is far from turnkey. There's a lot of work that needs to be done for it. This yeah. is how much we think renovations are going to be. This is our profit margin. So this is what we need to offer at. So we just Amazing. break it down into a mathematical science. But when we sh when when we present the comps, we always make it clear to back back out the expenses to make it an actual apples to apples comparison. Because if they're just looking yeah. at the sole data, that doesn't really tell you much. The seller's not walking away yeah. with that money. So you kind of give them a table. Here, here's how they work after renovation. Here's the price. You know, the adjusted price of that. That's house. right. Yeah. yeah. So we send it over. Uh, if it's a long distance negotiation, we send it, we send the comps over an email so they can see exactly what we're seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And are you still, like you said, things are picking up. So are you guys like picking up a deal or two a month right now or more or less? Yeah. So right now we're working on three deals. We wholesaled a deal this month, sight and scene. Um, we're, we're trying to get like three to four deals a month. Um, nice. I find that buyers are back for sure, but not every type of buyer is back. Like some of the buyers who are back are more sharks <laughs> who want a really discounted deal. Fair yeah. enough, all the power to them. Um, so we are still very picky and choosy on which deals make sense. Cause prior in 2022, yeah. 2021, you could get a, an average discount and end up selling it close to market value. Now that's yeah. not the case. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's not exactly what it was before. Yeah. You got to protect your downside, you know, because there's obviously a, there's obviously plenty of ways to lose. Uh, if your market's not appreciating, you got to get a better deal. And yeah, I know Toronto's appreciating right now, but you never know what, you know, three, four months from now. And I think a lot of the investors that are still in the game know that. So that's they, right. they want to get that deal. It makes sense. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. okay. So that's still keeping you busy. And then you're going to add mortgages to it. Obviously you're not working the full-time job anymore. So you got the time. Uh, there do you, you have go. a bit of a team <laughs> helping you out with your management, uh, of your rentals and, and your projects? Yes, I do. So by team, it's mainly property management and I get involved in tenant negotiations. Mm -hmm. Um, to be frank with you, it's probably better. I bring it in house, but it's a lot of work and there's other projects that I want to focus on. Yeah. So that's not as top of priority. I'll get involved again, tenant negotiations. So that's pretty much handled in terms of real estate acquisitions. I've slowed down. So I purchased the last couple purchases I made to actually add in my portfolio, I bought one in 2023, but that was supposed to be a flip. We just had to burn because we couldn't sell it. 2022, end of 2022, I bought four properties just because, uh, you know, no one was putting out offers there. Um, mm -hmm. This year, 
maybe I'll pick up one or two. I'm not making as much as an effort to scale my portfolio aggressively. Mm -hmm. I want to go the slow and steady route and focus yeah. on building stronger income streams. Because realistically, when I step back and took a look at my business, everything is tied into real estate, right? Yeah. And so... I need to make sure that my income streams are strong because to be able to take on these sort of burr, flip, or buy and hold projects, I need to ensure that I have reliable source of income. So that's my priority this year more mm -hmm. so than anything. You should diversify, get some stuff in the States and, uh, you know, then, then you're not all in Canadian real estate. So right, you, you can feel a little more <laughs> diversified. <laughs> I've been, I've been looking into the States. I think the big thing is, is what's holding me back is just the amount of work and effort that it's going to go into setting everything up again. Cause I feel like I have my, uh, I have my competitive advantage right now in this market. Oh I yeah. Just, It'd be, it'd be pretty difficult to set, uh, set, shut up shop from scratch somewhere It else. would. It depends on if you're going like a passive or an active business. But yeah, obviously, if you're used to the kind of returns you get from active investing, then you're not going to be happy with the uh, the passive angle down there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have uh, mm -hmm. like uh, virtual assistants in your business at all? People who work offsite? Yeah, so I have three virtual assistants. Um, one of them is on the Fast Ontario Home Buyer slash Ontario, like the wholesaling business, essentially. Mm -hmm. I have one helping with social media and then one helping with Rise. Uh, in terms of our org chart for the wholesaling business, uh, it's myself, it's the Bird Dogs. We have our admin. We used to have a dispo manager as well. Uh, during the down, sort of like the down cycle, uh, in wholesaling, unfortunately, it, we weren't like they just weren't able to justify sort of paying a fixed expense because it was a right. pretty high salary. Actually, to that point, like during the downside of wholesaling, we fixed everyone's expense. <laughs> we fixed acquisition uh, manager's expense. We fixed disposition. So our fixed costs were through the roof. So we had to sort of revert yeah. back and build the commission structure. Um, but the wholesaling business i'm doing the dispo at the moment soon enough i'll step out of that i'll probably have someone step in there working a commission basis um and yeah and then it should free up my time for the mortgage business right now nice. i'm probably working 30 30 hours a week so i could do much more than that yeah man that's awesome well uh I mean, I could talk to you for hours and, and I'll be uh, catching up with you again soon but uh <laughs> yeah. if you uh did you have anything you would like to share that i haven't asked you about today uh, no, not really. I think, uh, I think we did a good, good job catching up. There's a lot more, obviously, but there's uh, so much more. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm going to probably just give you a call outside of this and we'll catch up further. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's good talking to you. I mean, if you wanted to give people like a sentiment, you know, how to make it, how to do it today, like, what are your, what are your vibes on the market, how people should approach it? Uh, if you're, if you're a newer investor right now in, uh, in GTA, Southwestern Ontario, all that area. Yeah. If you're a newer investor, let's say that you're tight on capital. My best advice is just to start wholesaling or start bird dogging. And the reason being is, is because you learn a lot of the essential skills that's going to make you a real estate investor. Um, so with a couple of my bird dogs, some of them don't have any properties, but they're learning how to negotiate. They're learning how to uh, calculate max allowable offers. They're learning how to write offers. They're learning conditions without necessarily having any risk on the line and making some some money on the side. If you want to jump into investing, my recommendation is if you're tight on capital, because I know for a lot of people, liquidity is quite tight, is to partner with several people. Uh, I think for a lot of people getting into investing, long gone are the days where you do it solo because to fund renovations and down payment even in a market like cornwall which is a pretty small market you probably need at least 80 to a hundred thousand dollars between the renovations and down payment so it's probably better to to partner with a couple of your friends who are sort of in the same uh, have the same motivation as you have the same hunger as you and, and sort of get into the market that way and the expectations lastly ha has changed a lot don't go don't go into this expecting to sort of refinance projects within three to six months i think really now more than ever you have to look at investing as a long-term game but that's yeah. sort of my quick tidbits of advice yeah and and to add to what you said like you could just be you know the bird dog turned wholesaler and that's an active business or right. you're the one that bird dogs to find deals to add to your portfolio or or not bird dogs but you know off-market sources deals to your portfolio built in equity mm -hmm. and you know maybe if you get really good at that you can start putting them in and burring them because you're getting them at such a great price but That's i agree exactly with you 100 right. work to work to learn over work to earn especially if you're you're new 
uh, because you've got to learn before you, before you start pulling the trigger. But uh, yeah, mm-hmm. cool, man. Great talking to you. Where can people find you and follow you? You can follow me on Instagram at Austin Ye6 and on LinkedIn, Austin Ye. Uh, and you can also check out Rise Network, which is our Facebook community. Just Google that or search that on Facebook, Rise Network. Um, and then we also have our own podcast as well. Yeah, you're doing it all, man. Uh, very impressive. And uh, glad to have you in my network. And I'll, uh, I'll look forward to talking to you again. Really appreciate it, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Austin. Talk soon. And now a word from our sponsor, Control and Compound. Here's how infinite banking works in under 60 seconds. You have to save your money somewhere. Well, we think the best place to save it is inside a cash value life insurance policy. You save some money in there, it grows tax-free for the rest of your life. Then an opportunity or emergency comes comes along. Let's say a few years down the road, you can buy a business, buy a property, buy an income-producing asset. You leverage the infinite banking policy, borrow against your asset, take advantage of the opportunity. But your money still stays in the infinite banking policy. You're not borrowing your money, you're borrowing the insurance company's money. So your money's in the policy, it's in the opportunity, and it's providing a death benefit. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. You get to retirement and you have this massive cash value life insurance. Leverage that tax-free and you don't repay those loans. You sit on the beach and you spend that money tax-free every month. Doesn't show up on a tax return and you leave your family a huge tax-free death benefit. For more information, visit www.controllingcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines.